The idea is you sacrifice to Kelly and you bring forth its opposite. Now, it's it, I was once I thought I thought I understood I thought that I had come to understand the idea of sacrifice. I think I figured this out about 15 years ago. And it just blew, about blew me over when I figured it out because it had always been viewed either as a kind of an epiphenomena or as something that's pathological. But it's not. It's the most remarkable, it's one of the most remarkable conceptual discoveries that the human race has ever made. Because what it meant was we started to figure out that if you gave something what it wanted, if you gave something something of value, then you could turn it into something that might be beneficial to you. So it's the, it's, it's the concomitant of delayed gratification. Because delayed gratification is a sacrifice. So you know the the, the marshmallow experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get these little kids and you torture them. You say, look, hey, look, hey, you like marshmallows? It's like, yeah, I know you do. Okay, so here's a bunch of them. Now, if you don't eat those marshmallows, you get to have more marshmallows. And so then you leave, and some of the kids eat the marshmallows, right? And you gotta admit, those kids, there's something about them. They get the damn marshmallows. You know, and so if there was an earthquake, Right then, those kids would have won. Okay, so that's something to think about because delaying gratification is not always the right answer. The environment has to be stable enough so that the probability that you will get what you've delayed for is high. And so if you're living in sheer chaos, you're a fool to delay gratification. It's like, eat the damn marshmallow now. So, so it's not like delayed gratification is the solution for everything. It's not. But sometimes it's the solution. So what do you do? You make a sacrifice now, and the idea is it will pay off in the future. So then you think about that in archetypal forms. It means that you forego something of value now. It's a sacrifice. You let go of it. And the deal is, if you let go of it, better things will happen to you in the future. And, you know, no other animal has figured that out. Well, squirrels maybe, okay. you know, because they store nuts, but I don't really believe that they... I think it's fundamentally an instinct. You know, you know what I mean? I don't think they've generalized from that idea. They do act it out, but I don't think they've generalized from it. They haven't turned it into a concept. And so the concept here is the world is constituted such that it has a tremendously destructive element. But if you can barter with that properly, then you can flip it over and the part of it that's positive will, will reveal itself. It's like, that's bloody brilliant. It's unbelievably brilliant. And there's even another element to it, because let's say that all, you're, all you've been getting from reality for a while is Kelly. It's all spiders and snakes and fires and skull, you know, it's, and, and things that want to eat you. You might think, why is that? And one answer is, well, that's just what it's like. But then that's a problem, because that's not just what it's like. You know that the opposite is there, and you might say, well, where, where the hell is that? Like, why is it hiding its face from me? And one answer is, I, reality is, cannot be contended with. That's one answer. But that's like, you're depressed and hopeless as soon as that happens. It's like, you're done. Here's another answer. You might be doing something wrong. And then you might think, well, what would it mean to be doing something wrong? And then we might say, maybe you're hanging on to something you value a little too tightly. Maybe one of your axiomatic presuppositions, like the thing that's at the top of your damn value structure, is actually sufficiently outdated or pathological, such that if you hold on to it, all you're going to get is frowns and misery. So maybe you have to let it go. That's a sacrifice. And so maybe that's why the rule is when you're making sacrifices to Kelly, any okay, other God for that matter, is don't sacrifice the low quality junk. You sacrifice the stuff that you're attached to. Because if things aren't going right, it could be that it's because you're attached to the wrong things. Now that's interesting. That's starting to get very interesting because that means that people are starting to think, maybe my attitude has something something I can change. Like maybe it's not just the factual nature of the external world. It's something I can contend with and dance with. And maybe if I readjusted my moral schema, the probability is kind of low that Kelly will be there all the time, and it'll be 
pretty high that her positive counterpart shows up. So then the question might be, how do we set, make the sacrifices that are necessary to organize our schema of interpretation and behavior such that when we implement it in the world, reality shines its positive face on us and not its negative face? And like that's an incredibly complicated problem, right? I mean, that's like that's a problem human beings have been trying to figure out, and animals for that matter, forever. You know, it wasn't until there were human beings that we started to get some conceptual representation of it. But then the other thing too is you guys are all doing that. You have a big bet going with nature, and the bet is make some sacrifices right now. Or maybe your parents are making sacrifices on your behalf. And what's the bet? The bet is, it'll be worth it. But what does that mean? It means that if you make the proper sacrifices, you discipline yourself, you don't, you're not too dissolute with your resources, you pay attention, and you wait, your life will be better. Well, that's pretty cool, because it might be true. And if it's true, then none of this is an illusion or delusion. It's just low resolution, first pass representation, and that's smart. And so, you know, from a Piagetian perspective, well, what do you do before you understand something? You act it out. And so the people that are making sacrifices, they're acting out this idea. Do they know the idea? Depends what you mean by know. No. They're acting it out. They're dramatically representing it. Is that knowledge? Well, it's a form of knowledge. You know? Is it the kind of abstract knowledge that we're talking about right now? No. But it's the immediate precursor to that. You don't get from the phenomena to the articulation without running it through some bodily representations and some drama. And this is so damn complicated that you know you probably couldn't get to it until you had civilizations that were pretty damn good and lots of people thinking about this all the time. You know, and so the person who came up with this, they would have experienced it as a religious revelation. It's like, what's the nature of reality? Poof, you get this image, you know, it's of this multi-armed goddess, and it's it's in flames, and it's in a web, and it's like terrifying you. It's terrifying you. You're gripped by it, and you make a representation. And part of the reason you worship it is because the bloody thing has got you in its grip. And no wonder, because there is an idea behind that that's so powerful that you should be gripped by it. You should be unable to forget it. Because it's, a, it's an absolute, it's a stellar stroke of genius. It's a real revelation. And it sets the whole human race on the path to making the proper sacrifices so that the fire and the bugs and the insects and the snakes and the tigers stay the hell away. And a good thing. It's a good thing. And then maybe now and then, you know, the world's configured so that it's beneficial to us. Um, I'm not sure if this is the greatest moment, but um, I asked a question before. I'm not sure if uh, you got to it last class. But... say it's the expression of something that's at the foundation of knowledge. So it's like an innate axiom of representation and, and behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's archetypes that make us human rather than lions or ants. Okay. We have human archetypes. And, and those are the things that we can't dispense with. They're, they're built into us. Yeah. Like, well, jealousy would be an archetype, for example. It's an archetypal pattern. 
um, hunger, thirst, all of these things that are common to everyone. But there are more, there are more conceptual archetypes too, like, like these. You know, it's a, it's a fuzzy word. But it, it, it has to do with the element of ideation and action that are not merely culturally constructed, let's say. Is it something like, um, in, in the realm of genes, is, there, is it something like there has to be a substrate but then it also has to be triggered or activated by something? Or is it just kind of already pre -loaded? Well, that's a good question. Like, I, I, that's a good question. Um, I, I, don't, I, think the, I think I can answer that in some sense by analogy. Children would not be able to learn language unless they had the archetype of language at hand. Right, does it have to be triggered? Twins sometimes come up with their own language. Identical twins. So they'll just create a language. You know? And so there's a pretty powerful language creating capacity. But generally speaking, yes, it's triggered because you're thrown into an environment where language is the norm. But you can throw a chimp in there, and that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Now, what it is that make people able to generate language, is, that's complicated, because partly it's you have the right mouth, you have the right tongue, you have the right... is, is representation useful? And the answer is, so far, so good. You know, it's Not like... Not necessarily useful, but just that, like, the thing itself, once represented, does that representation now filter back in and then change the thing that started out? Yes, I would say it does that in all sorts of ways. Okay. So, for example, in some ways, the dominance hierarchy is a way that animals organize themselves in an environment. But if they do that long enough, it becomes the environment. Right? Because once, it's, once the adaptation has been there for 100 million years, it's no longer an adaptation. It's part of the environment. 